All right. Now I get this right in front of me. I will show you a little bit more of what we do in terms of like foundational models for materials and chemistry. And we do this, you heard about the AI Alliance already, so we do this in the framework of the AI Alliance. So the whole AI Alliance point is make AI in the open source. And one of the examples is our granite family. In the granite family, we have models for language. We have a lot of models for code, time series, and the newest one is the geospatial models, which is basically weather models or Earth observation models. We are now working on getting our chemistry models into the granite family as well. Our granite models perform really well in the transparency index from Stanford, so they're ranked top five. And the code fine-tuned models from granite are basically demonstrate best-in-class performance. So we have a working group for materials within the AI Alliance, and everybody is welcome to join, and I have a link later on that where we really try to drive the open source development for materials and chemistry and for these kind of like materials the semiconductor industry, for example, is interested in. You heard a lot about data sharing today already, how important that is, especially in the field where data is scarce, and we need high quality data to develop these models. And what we also look for is like the creation of benchmarks. So in the field where we work on, there aren't really good benchmarks. There's a lot of benchmarks in the pharma space for chemistry, but not in the kind of materials we are looking for in the semiconductor industry, for example. We're trying to get people together in that work group, which are either from the AI side and develop models or agents, and experimental people who can bring high quality data and use cases problems and match these people up, not always with us in the mix. So it could be also like two different parties that are not IBM working on a project together. And we had the kickoff in May in Tokyo, and some people are maybe still here from that kickoff where we started off this work group, Slack channel started, and there's a bi-weekly meeting in the Asia time zone. We had a second gathering in July in Vienna at the ICML, which basically kicked up our European part of the work group. So we have bi-weekly meetings now in the European time zone, and we're very quickly now ramping on the America and South America time zone group as well, which will then be the America's time zone with also bi-weekly virtual meetings. This is a general AI alliance development with all the companies that are part of it. We had our first model, open source model release during the ICML event, which is a SMILES model. So for everybody who's not into chemistry, SMILES is basically a text representation of a chemical structure. And we released that so you can either join the work group or get the model from GitHub or Hugging Face. And I go now into a little bit more what we do for the like chemistry and materials. So what we have in IBM Research, we call this accelerate discovery. We basically take the best that comes out of AI quantum, put this on the hybrid cloud, and try to build systems to accelerate the discovery in the area of sustainable materials, climate and sustainability. That's where the geospatial models came out from, and life sciences, so more in the pharmaceutical truck discovery space. And for that, we build, we worry about the data. We do deep curation out of documents, patents, and open access journal articles, do some data mining, have augmented data pipelines that are specifically for model training. And as we talked earlier, we take care of the privacy and copyright and all these things of the data. We then develop multimodal foundational models for materials. And then these models can be fine-tuned for certain applications where you have then the scarce data. And then we also do a pipeline for consumption, how you work with these models in terms of AI agents, workflow automation, and we have some conversational interfaces for the chemists who can't code, basically, so it's easy for them to connect to the models. You all know about foundational models and the power they have, but again, in the chemistry field, since we have scarce data, the plan is basically we train it on different modalities of chemistry, and I will go into more detail on that on just a very day of organic chemistry at the moment. And then, for example, if you want to have a photoresist for the, your semiconductor process, you fine tune it specifically for the absorption of your photoresist. And for that, you don't need that much data anymore if you have the, the foundation model that was just trained on the larger organic molecule data sets. So these are the different modalities we are training the models on right now. So as I said, we have a SMILES model already released. So that's the simple form of representing a chemical structure so these are basically like string-like texts. So you put the chemical structure into these strings, which is then easy for a computer to read. It's really hard for any chemist to read. And then you can just use any architecture you would use for text, like a transformer model. We did the same for polymers now. So polymers is a little bit more complicated how you do this inline annotation. But we did our first polymer model. The second step is then you do a graph model where you really do the, take the 2D graph of a molecular structure and translate that into a graph model. 
And then the next step is basically taking the 3D positions of the atoms. So we have the first model that was trained on X-ray data, where you actually analyze the crystal structure that you know where each atom is. And then now we're training models that take the electronic density in 3D space of these molecules, which is in training right now. And the last one is we have a text model that takes the description of a molecule and the molecule and trains on that, which can predict the very simple properties of the molecule. So we then can take each of these one modality models and fuse them to a multimodal model. And with that, we can do some powerful downstream tasks. So one is you can do cross-modal inferences, for example, a smile in, you can get a text description out, or you can have a smile in, you can calculate the spectra data of a molecule for like analysis, or you can predict properties. To go into a little bit more details into each of these models, and this is the SMILES model. So this is a transformer-based encoder-decoder model that was trained on 2091 million samples. Sure that we only use samples that are real-world examples of chemicals and not computer-generated chemicals, just to have more high-quality data. And we have two versions of that. One is a, a classical transformer-based, and one is a member-based version. The member-based version, I showed this on the next slide, has advantages that the inference is much, more, much faster and doesn't cost so much GPU power. Um, on the lower side, you see basically the key performance versus some Benchmarks, again, these benchmarks are mainly in the pharma field and not so much in the industrial chemical field, but they perform much better than basically the state of the art that was out there. And on the right side, you see the different models we have. We have open source two of them. Right now, we are in the process of releasing the Mamba one, and then we also, the others one are already in basically waiting for release. We just have to go through our internal approval process. So this is the Mamba model. And as you can see here, it has a much lower inference time, so it's 54% faster and basically reduces your GPU hours by six hours, which if you, do, if you run these a lot on a lot of data, that really has a lot of cost saving and time saving. This is the molecular graph model, so if you go from a chemical structure, you translate this into a graph and put this in a graphical neural network, you'll see the performance down there. This one was developed together with JSR and they tested it on some of the use cases and found really good performance of it. This one is the 3D atom position I talked earlier on. This was trained on what we call metal organic frameworks. So these are crystal structures of metal oxides with organic components in them, and you can do crystal analysis on them with X-ray characterization where you know where each atom is, and then you can train basically a 3D atom position model. And the last one, which is in training right now, so we don't have any data how well it performs, but it's basically the idea that we calculate DFT electron densities that you can calculate with classical simulation methods, and then train basically a text-to-image model on that to really know where the 3D electronic structure is, which you then can use to predict chemical synthetic path and a lot of the electronic properties of a material like the homo lumo level. We participated in a GitHub challenge on can we take a text description of a chemical and the chemical and predict basically simple properties of that chemical. There's a little example here of one of these captions, which is already pretty advanced. Sometimes these captions are just, it's a yellow liquid, or it has a smell, or it has a certain boiling point. And what we found, it works really well as long as it's just one property to predict in that sentence, then we had a really good performance. When you go into more advanced properties or several properties in a text, then it didn't perform too well. So these are the different models we have. So I want to jump quickly into the fusion. We use the mixture of expert as a fusion algorithm for now. So the first one we did was just on the SMILES base models and the graph models, but we already saw that we got a way better performance if we do the mixture of expert multimodal fusion of the two models. So once we have all the other modalities, we can then fuse them all together into one strong model. We do uncertainty characterization on, on these models because for scientists, and everybody who works in physical systems knows the answer is very important, and you have to know how certain the model is of the answer. If you ask any large language model something, the, the large language model is always very certain at the beginning that this is the right answer, and if you ask again, like, how do you know it, then it comes up with, oh, I actually don't know anything at all. So these models will give you the value, but it will also give you the uncertainty of the model, how certain it is that the value is correct, which is very useful for scientists to know is the model confident that this is the right answer or not. We have like basically a pipeline how a user who's not too knowledgeable can uh, fine tune this on their own. 
We use this for battery material design. So we made basically a model for the electrolyte formulation. So this is not a model for just one chemical anymore. This is then a model where different chemicals get mixed together in certain ratios to build an electrolyte for batteries. And you see our model in the corner here that it has the best performance from all the other methods. We use this for semiconductors, but we also use it for basically model environmental impact factors in building like digital trends of the process itself. On the PFAS, what I talked earlier about is these like forever chemicals that show up in the process of the semiconductor industry. So we are building what we call a PFAS workbench with an agentic workflow that can help you identify where you have the most hazardous PFAS materials in your product portfolio by going through basically your supply chain documents, and then you can rank them of the most concerning materials or the, the most common materials in your product and find like easy substitu substitutes if there are any. We also have a project at IBM that looks into these carbon dioxide capture materials. These are these Martello organic framework where we had the 3D model from. And these frameworks are basically forming these pores, and the pore have a certain, you can change the chemistry within the pores, and you can design them in a way that the air flows through that they capture CO2, but let the oxygen and nitrogen and the other gases flow through, and they can basically filter out carbon dioxide from air, capture it, and then release it later into the lab, and then build something out of it, basically, and get it out of our, our atmosphere. And I mentioned this earlier today. We are building what we call the life cycle materials design, so we really want to go into a more circular design of your materials. You don't start from fossil fuel feedstocks, but try to have your feedstock out of a recyclable product. And then at the end of the life cycle of the product, you chemically recycle it back into a feedstock material where you can build new organic molecules out of it. So we're trying to plug in all the models we are doing into a tool that you can analyze when you want to design a material, how you can design it with these things in mind. And lastly, we have this conversational interface on it, which was designed for users who don't want to deal with a Python notebook to run all these models. So there's a, a chatbot where you can ask the model to come up with candidates, depending on their description. You can ask them for synthetic pathways, so it will show the pathway to make certain molecules. You can plot some data from like table data you get from the models. So it's an easy way for chemists to interact with a system like that. There are two words for our model and also our work group in the AI Alliance. And you can always contact me if you have questions. Thank you.